Listen up. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Louisville Urban League's pod sh- podcast and radio show hosted every week on WLLV 101.9 FM. Um, you can catch us live on Thursdays from 12 to 12.30, or you can catch us anytime you like during the week at your favorite podcast locations. And now you can even catch us on YouTube. Welcome back. Um, my name is Lyndon Pryor. I am the interim president and CEO of the Louisville Urban League, and it is an honor to be back with you. I hope that you have had a wonderful and uh, blessed week for those of you who were enjoying spring break with your little ones. I hope that you had a good time away. Um, but it is just good to be back here, where, as I say, this is a great uh, space of solace and 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 respite for me to come here and be able to talk to you all and to share with some of our great friends and partners of the league before we jump into today's show i just want to make sure i lift up those who have been impacted by the shootings um that have gone on this week um once again our community and this nation is rocked by the effects of unnecessary gun violence and um, my heart simply goes out to those who have been unimaginably impacted um, by the devastation that's happened in our city this week and though this is not going to be the focus of, of this week's pod I just have to say that you know this all feels avoidable right um, and there will be those who, who want to say that this is not the time for these types of conversation, but I don't know when there's a better time to have them. Um, we can do better as a city. We can do better as a state. Um, we can do better as a country in how we handle these things because it is the guns and we've got to do more about the guns in our community. So yes, I'm sure we'll have more conversation on what has transpired and um, what we as the league will do um, on this issue or what more we can do on this issue. But um, there's just much more to, to come there. And so again, my, my heartfelt condolences to those who have been impacted uh, by the shootings this week. But I mean, all of the shootings that have taken place this year and throughout our communities. Um, we just have to do better. Now, this week, um, I am blessed and honored again to have another big homie on the show. Um, somebody who who embraced me uh, when we got to when we got to the city and who has been ten toe down, ten toes down with me since being here. Um, and somebody who was making his mark on the city uh in in a number of different ways i want you all to welcome to the pod uh mr savage bass how are you doing sir i am doing great i want to give a big shout out to you uh for welcoming me into the space and being a part of the podcast today absolutely brother it's good to have you on um, like I tell everybody, man, this is really informal. We do not script this show. We do not plan it out. Um, and sometimes it, that it, it shows <laughs> in the final product because we kind of meander all over the place. Um, but it is good to have you here. And so we just going to wrap a little bit, talk the way that we do, um, find out what's going on with you and, and really talk about this work. Because one of the things about this show and why we do it and how we have entered in this space is to really be able to expound and talk about the work certainly that the urban league is doing itself but also the work and the people and the partners that we are connected to because there's no way in the world that we can do this by ourselves right there's there's too much going on there's too much um the the lift is too heavy we can't be all things to all people um but that is why we have great friendships great partnerships great allies 
who are out there doing other parts of this work um, in order to to get our people, to get black people to to true spaces of freedom and liberation, right? And so that's going to take a multi pronged approach, and we're going to continue to do that. And so you are doing um, a good chunk of that work um, in what you're doing, and we're going to dive into that in a little bit. But for those who are who are uninitiated and who don't know you, um, I like to give you know some space for you to talk about. Uh, a, a little bit about who you are and how you came to be in this space. So give the folks um, kind of the quick and dirty on who Savvy is um, and how you've arrived in this point. I appreciate that. Um, so of course, I'm Savvy Shabazz. I am founder and CEO of Life Coach Each One Teach One Reentry Fellowship. I'm also the president of All of Us in Nun, Kentucky. We work with individuals that are formerly incarcerated and those that are currently incarcerated and we provide those services and support, supportive needs to make sure that they make those successful transitions back to their families and communities as well. Uh, we have a voting rights campaign. We're really big on that, assisting with the bills and everything that we need to get passed, get people not only registered to vote, but get people to the polls, that GOT effort. And that's usually when we link up around GOTV time. Uh, I'm originally from Paducah, Kentucky, born and raised. Uh, shout out to P-Town, as I always say. I've been here in Louisville uh, since 2010. Uh, got here by what, way of what I call government vacation, uh, where they put you in a uniform and they pay for everything. You just can't leave and go home to your families, right? So I was sentenced to a total of 28 years in McCracken County for nonviolent drug offenses. Um, I served a total of five and a half years. I uh, had a lot of time to really sit and think uh, and get myself together as a young adult uh, and, and got out and, and was released trying to do things the way it's supposed to be done. I found myself just kept getting laid off from different jobs, you know, mm. uh, 60, 120 days uh, I, layoff time, right? Mm. I'm working overtime or working weekends, you know, uh, first one there, last one to leave, but I'm always the first one to get laid off, right? Mm. Uh, going to... Uh, try to get unemployment and, and I was denied uh, because they said I didn't work a period of, of three periods. I didn't know what that was, right? Mm. Uh, six months. I'm like, well, it's awfully funny. I get laid off right at six months, right? Mm. Uh, so I tried, tried again, no problem, no problem until I was pushed in a corner and I went back to that environment. I was also uh, raised in the largest projects in Paducah, Kentucky. Shout out to Emwood Court. Uh, that's why a lot of my integrity and more values was built at. A lot of the friends that I still have to this day, I met in Elmwood Court. And I mm -hmm. still talk to those guys every day, uh, those sisters and brothers. Uh, they they groomed me to who I am. Um, got an opportunity to move here in Louisville. I was in the halfway house. Um, Dismas Charities around the corner, right, right around the corner from where we're at now. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to go to school. I'd already been to be a certified carpenter. Uh, but I sat in prison for four and a half years and wasn't able to, to, to utilize that trade. So I lost the trade. Mm. I lost the love for it mostly. Uh, so I wanted to go to school, JCTC. I'm seeing students come in every day. You know, they're making great grades at JCTC. I want to do that too. I want to know what a liberal education is, right? Mm. So I talked to my case manager and um, said that, you know, that's what we would do, you know. And I waited for about four months till it was time for the list to come out. Uh, the list came out. My name wasn't on it. Mm. I adjusted my glasses and wiped them off. I looked again, and I was like, my name's not on here. So I went in his office, in my case manager's office, uh, as humbly as I could, asking uh, why my name was not on the list. And he informed me that he didn't put my name on the list because he didn't feel I was college material mm. and that JCTC and U of L would be a waste of time and resources, and they would eat me alive. Mm. I'm learning now in a leadership program, a national leadership program, that you get the best leadership. And I want to share this with you because you just stepped into a leadership position too. Right. The best leaders are found when there's a challenge. And he challenged me. And I went and stood in front of the director's office for about four hours. I wasn't going down. I missed count twice. And that's one of the highest offenses you can do and you can commit in the Department of Corrections. It's what they call bucking count. Mm. I'm not reporting to my bed area for count. She said, you can be sent back for that. I was like, well, you're just going to send me back to somewhere I've already been anyway. Mm. And she asked me what it was about. And I told her my education, my name's on the list. And she looked at me up and down and she said, 
You stand right here. I'll count you right here because if you stand for nothing, you will fall for anything. Hmm. Director looks out, left me out there for another hour. He looks out again, left me out there for another 45 minutes. Finally, he let me in and uh, he said I couldn't go to college because my case manager had put in my file that I hadn't graduated from high school. And I was like, well, if I hadn't graduated from high school, how did I get a high school diploma? Mm-hmm. And I passed him a copy of my high school diploma. Big shout out to my sister for sending that information in. She also sent my transcripts from West Kentucky Tech. Where I took blueprint reading as well. If I didn't graduate from high school, how do I have these documents? He knew that was a problem. Mm-hmm. He switched my case manager, um, switched my case manager, put, came out with a new list, gave me an opportunity. Long story short, I went out to JCTC and I performed. I won the highest award. You can win out there the humanitarian award. Uh, uh, for, yeah, it was it was it was for outstanding achievement. Made the dean's list. I never thought I could make the dean's list. Made no. the dean's list. I've never made a 4.0 GPA. I never fell before below a 3.5. I was excited in high school as an athlete. Just give me a 2.0 and I can play ball. Right. You know, I think the highest GPA I had in high school was maybe a 2.4, and that was exciting for me. You know, mm-hmm. and here I am now taking African American studies. I was the first person to earn the African American studies uh, certificate at JCTC, Jefferson Community and Technical College. Uh, So I studied African-American studies, uh, sociology, psychology, and I just fell in love with people Mm -hmm. and learning about myself. Um, I went on and transferred and graduated and went to University of Louisville. I had Dr. Hamilton and Dr. Cooper. They pulled me in the office. They said, you performed out here at African-American studies. If you decide to go to U of L, we ask that you meet with the Dr. Ricky Jones. Mm-hmm. And I met with the Dr. Ricky Jones, and it was very exciting. Uh, he was waiting on me on the elevator, and I thrived in that Pan-African Studies program, and I found myself. Mm-hmm. But I also found a love for my people and for my community, too. And that pride that was instilled in me in those classes and those conversations, I felt at that point I'm liberated. I'm not, I, I got to find a way to get this back mm-hmm. to other people, right? So that was the educational part. I got an opportunity. I struggled with job, different jobs. Uh, I had a friend tell me I worked at Packington Unlimited mm-hmm. over on 17th of McCloskey. Everybody I was in prison with worked there for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we worked there over the summer, and um, you know, I was still in school. I uh, didn't have a lot of income coming in. That was about $8 an hour uh, for some labor that we was really doing. We should have been getting paid probably $20, $25 an hour. Mm. Um, stuck with it because I got responsibilities every month, too. Mm-hmm. If you don't take care of those responsibilities, I got a landlord to leave a nasty note on your door right. first, between the first and the fifth, right? Mm-hmm. So I had to stick it out. You know, I, as an adult, I have to take care of myself, right? Uh, stuck it out, and I got an opportunity. I had never heard of what community organizing was, and it was this place, uh, the, the, the Louisville Urban League. They had this initiative, the Zones of Hope. And I was like, what is this? Like, mm-hmm. you know, well, you should come to the meetings and this. And now I got to come into the meetings. And I was already connected with an organization called uh, NC3, Network mm-hmm. for Community Change. And I'm seeing all the same people in here, but now we're doing Zones of Hope. And it was just something about it with people telling me you should apply. Like, I don't know what organ. like, what is that, right? Did some research. I ran a Huey P. Newton and the Black Panthers, and they was organizing. And I'm like, so this is similar, com- community organizing, right? Mm-hmm. Fill out the application. That was the first job I ever had in my life, mm. making $15 an hour. Um, I'd ever made in my hometown was $12 an hour. Mm. And it was for some very extensive labor. And I hate getting up. And nobody, wants to, nobody wants to dislike the job. I loved coming in here, being able to go into the different community centers and Boys and Girls Club and build relationships mm-hmm. and go to this meeting, and shake hands. And this is what we're doing. So it was an initiative to improve the livelihood and outcomes of young black men and boys. Right. Uh, and it was in five particular neighborhoods. Let me see if I still got it. Russell, Shawnee Park in California, Newburgh. Mm-hmm. I haven't said that in years, right? Right. <laughs> but that was our focus, you know, and it, it opened us some doors. It gave me a, a, a great opportunity to build some friendships uh, with, with a lot of people throughout the community. And I moved on uh, mm-hmm. to reimage. Mm-hmm. Uh, we worked with individuals 18 to 24 that had, been, had a brush with the court system. Uh, this is where I learned to do case management work. I hadn't had a clue. Mm-hmm. You know, when I started school, I didn't even know how to send an attachment on Blackboard for my, I didn't know what that paper clip meant on mm-hmm. the email. <laughs> I had to ask one of my classmates, what, right. I, I, what does that mean, right? So I got that opportunity. I worked at Pivot to Peace the whole time I was there as a violence prevention organization. I moved on to um, 
uh, Jefferson Community and Technical College. Um, after that, I moved on to the Bell Project. And during that time, I was finding myself too. Uh, and I decided I had this program that I actually drawn up and designed while I was in prison at, at, at Green River, uh, 1200 River Road, doing five bed 186. Mm -hmm. I remember exactly what I was, I stay up late night and I'm like, what does, it, what does it look like to assist people that are coming home from prison? Because this is packed and people shouldn't even be in here, right? Right. I was in prison, man, with some people that's got like 1,200 years, mm. 400, 800 years. I had a guy ask me when I see parole, I told him I got 18 months left. I asked him and he said he doesn't have parole. He's been in since 1976. Man. And so that was a wake up call. So I designed that program. Uh, life coach, each one teach one renter fellowship while I was in prison. Um, and I stuck with it, I stuck mm -hmm. with it, you know, late night, I get off work at five o'clock. I go back to design it, put this in it. I take this out. I take this out. How does this sound? Let me finally in 2018, get it to where, let me run a trial and see if it works. Mm -hmm. It worked. Uh, we were getting guys. I was going into the uh, business facility that I actually been incarcerated in and facilitating that program. And the guys are actually coming out to my office, taking the curriculum mm -hmm. and they succeeded. All right. We got people employed. We got people scholarships. We got a guy that got accepted into the speed school, uh, school, school of engineering. He can't even realize how major that was. And he looked just like us. Right. You know, that's unheard of, right? <laughs> you know, and he got a background like mine and you're yeah. in the speed school of engineering, right? So it, it worked. Uh, we received some funding. Uh, that would assist us. I didn't know what to do with it. You know, we needed administrators. We need materials. We, we needed everything that you could get to, you know, to, to, to make this happen. But I'm working at the same time with organizations like the Bell Project. Uh, I joined a national organization, FICPFM, Formerly Incarcerated Convicted People and Families Movement. Mm -hmm. I joined all of us a non-national, so I started to travel. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was granted my first trip to Oakland. Um, to the hub where all of us and none is at through the urban league mm -hmm. it was professional development. Uh, I still got pictures of me with the tag on from the urban league. And I remember I was challenged, um, by Sadiq Reynolds and she gave me some business cards and she said, I need you to get out this amount of business cards per day. And I also need you to get these business cards back. Mm -hmm. in this amount too. So I'm like, if I give out 50, I mean, I got to have 50 back, right? Mm -hmm. I really tried that too. I took one, one of my partners went out there, Shelton McElroy, shout out to him. He introduced shout out me Shelton. To, hey, he introduced me to that yeah. national network. And he's like, savvy man, like you were talking to everybody, like you really utilize that. I was like, that's what she asked me to do. Mm -hmm. I get back and my assignment was to take these cards because these are not cards. Mm -hmm. You don't put them in your pocket and wash them. You don't put them on mantles and let them sit up there for years. You take that information and you put them into your Google contacts. And when you send information out, you send it out to every last contact that you got. Mm -hmm. I got over 1,200 contacts in my phone and on my Google Drive now because that's what I do. Right. Um, again, go, going back to, to, to employment with the uh, Bell Project, then I went to CEO, uh, working with people, getting them trained up, getting them employment that was coming home from prison. And something hit me. Mm -hmm. And I was like, either you're going to take this opportunity and you're going to keep building everyone else's organizations out while you neglect yours, or you're going to step out on faith. And do that. My grandfather used to say, swim or drown. Yeah. If you don't take this time right now, because if somebody's going to give you some funding mm -hmm. for your program, one, they believe in you and the work that you're doing. Two, they trust you. Step out on faith. I have been running Life Coach Each One, dedicated to Life Coach Each One Teach One Reentry Fellowship every day since January the 4th of last year. Uh, we're located in New Legacy. Uh, we assist individuals, like I said earlier, coming home uh, from, from incarceration. Those that are currently incarcerated as well, we have a communications initiative where we provide stamps for a list of individuals that we have that are locked up in uh, incarcerated in the Department of Corrections. Uh, we usually send stipends. They have recently restricted my access corrections account. Uh, I've sent several emails out. I've sent made several phone calls. It's been like that for the last four months. I don't know how we're going to resolve that other than changing my information. Wow. We'll find a way. Yeah. Uh, but we want to assist individuals and bring some of the attention down 
and get people prepared for when they come home. Right. We got to find more savvies. Yeah, absolutely, man. And that's, that is phenomenal. And I just, Hey, I mean, I let you, you lay it all out for us here and yeah. that's, yeah, it's a beautiful that. thing. And, and, you know, your story is so special. And I'll say, you know, just for the audience, right? Like, when you came to the league to work with zones, like that's how you and I got connected. Yeah. You know, I was assisting with that program at first. And then actually, um, before we closed the program out, that grant out, you know, I was, I was, uh, supervising and, you know, we got real close in that point period in terms of working with those guys and doing that work because it was so incredibly important. And so, so much of your work obviously has been centered around, you know, this, this re-entry journey. And, you know, I, I have, um, obviously, we, we are all connected and attached to folks who have been, um, you know, a part of the carceral system in some way, shape, or form. Um, and, and I'm certainly no stranger to that, given, you know, friends, family members, and the whole nine. And, and I've come, as I've gotten older and come to understand it more, you know, it's, it's strange to what we do to people who who get locked up, right? Like, yeah. I mean, the prison system in and of itself is is just a, a cold and very cruel um, systematic mechanism that that is doing lots and lots of damage. But even if you know you know somebody wanted to be you know I, I don't know optimistic and say that well you know folks just serve their time and they get out. What we know from experiences like yours and the work that you do and even the work that we do here at the league is that we have created a system that is meant to punish people well after they have, quote unquote, served their time. That's a fact. Right. And so in some instances, you've got folks coming out of jail, um, you know, 20, 22, 25 years old, but effectively serving a life sentence because of all of the different barriers and obstacles that are put in their way for folks who may have had some interaction, some engagement with the system very early on in life. And so I wonder for you, right? Like I know you're doing the hands-on work and in terms of work, you know, reaching guys and men and women, um, you know, that come across your plate, but what do we do with the system, right? Like what, in your view, is the move we have to make around this entire carceral system that we've set up that is punishing people exponentially on top of whatever sentence may have been handed down in a courtroom? We tear the system down. Mm. Uh, I'm an advocate for that system. Uh, and that's one of the things within my curriculum is getting the right materials so individuals can understand what system they are in. Maybe if they think twice before going into the system. But a lot of the factors with going into the system are not upon us, mm. upon our environment. Poverty is one of the number one reasons. Right. So there's a lot of grassroots reasons, the reason a lot of people are incarcerated. It's not because people just want to people, my people I work with, they're not selling drugs. It's because they want to be a baller because they want all the nice things. People are trying to survive. Right. And if you tell a person no so many times and their lights are constantly getting cut off, what do you expect that person to do? Mm -hmm. You know, not knowing a lot of times the media doesn't show that uh, this individual has been, has been racial profiled at work. He's the first one to be laid off or fired every time. You know, he has two, he or she has two or three children that they have to take care of. And those pampers don't stop. You know, those pampers and bottles, pampers are going to always be used and bottles are going to always need to be filled. Right. You know, so what do you do at that point? And people resort to what they know. Mm -hmm. And that's what we see. And this is where the system comes in at. And the, what's available. And what's right available. Now. Right. Right. One of the biggest things I always say, because I speak out a lot of things about, the, the, you know, the jail issues. You know, I speak out a lot about politics and, and, and things that's going on in Frankfurt. I do a lot of rallying in Frankfurt as well. I do a lot of lobbying in Frankfurt as well. We got to stop arresting people. Mm. You know, we, we talk about overcrowding, right? Stop arresting people because they're homeless. That is not a crime. Right. You know, living on the corner 
it's not a crime and you shouldn't be arrested for living up under a bridge, mm. right? That is not a crime. We got to stop arresting people. Uh, we got to stop calling police because we lost our dog. Mm. You know, there's a lot of mental health things that we have out in our community as well. And that's one of them that nobody's talking about. And I'm glad you opened up that door for me to come into this space. Nobody's talking about the mental health issues that people are faced with when they come out of prison. Yeah. Talk just to figure it out. Yeah. I mean, you handed what? Your personal effects? Maybe a bus ticket? Maybe a bus ticket. I was handed my clear 13-inch TV right here in Portland at Dismas, a clear laundry bag, and I had about $3.50 in my pocket. Good luck. Yeah. And I've been in, like, tw at that moment, 29 months, and I'm like, you give me an hour to get to pro probation and parole? If I don't make it, I get sent back. You know? Uh, it's, it's, it's a lot. Yeah. Uh, I always stand on, we, we, we got to turn that system down. I don't know if we can fix it. Because it looks like it's been working in our communities against our people just the way it's been designed to work. Mm -hmm. And that's the reality, right? Like, is this is, you know, folks, you know, go back to the constitutional amendment that, that abolished slavery, except folks often forget that it says except. Duly <laughs> convicted of a crime. Right. And so we have just continued to persist that. And now we have, you know, found all sorts of creative ways to monetize that system. And so now we've incentivized, mm -hmm. you know, sending people back. And so I, I appreciate, you know, I think the abolitionist movement and I'll say even for myself, right, like is is hard to wrap, you know, one's mind around. I think people, and I certainly think for, for lay people out in community, that is um, a difficult uh, concept to kind of, to come into this, this idea that we, we should be tearing this entire system down. Like surely there are folks who need, um, you know, who need to be punished or kept away from society. And perhaps um, that may be the case. We can certainly think about um, heinous crimes that are committed uh, in our society, unfortunately, all the time. But I don't think, um, and it depends on which abolitionist you ask, I don't think it's about saying that there is no space for uh, dealing with or holding people accountable, right, for the things that they have. But it is saying that the systems in which we currently have really aren't about accountability. Um, they are simply about uh, exponential and outsized punishment um, in ways that oftentimes even getting there aren't uh, fair or just or representative of um, the situations to the point that you made earlier of how people even get there, right? Like they don't take into account the systems that are, have been set up to dehumanize and oppress um, and marginalize people to such an extent to where the only opportunities that somebody may even have access to realistically um, are those things which might land them in this carceral system to begin with, right? And so we've got to do a better job of thinking and rethinking how it is that, that, that we even think about the way in which our society is, is set up and how it is that we are tracking people into um, a space that we know is ultimately going to do them more harm um, and almost never any good. So for you, in terms of, you know, the, uh, the work that you're doing now with Life Coach, each one, teach one, what does that look like, right? Like at a very practical level, right? Like, so now getting out of the systematic perspective of this, but now, you got folks coming to you, you know, fresh out the system, just like, just like you were. Maybe I know you're even making contact with folks inside. What does that look like on a day-to-day -day basis with child's work? One of the first things I do, and I tell people all the time, uh, and I was challenged when I started here. I was asked, what's the first thing you do as soon as you wake up? I check my emails. Mm. That's the second thing I do when I come into my office, right? So I have to answer those emails, look over everything, uh, get my day started. I have a calendar. Uh, of course, we have meetings all the time. If I have a one-on-one, -on -one, we have people that reach out all the time from different types of organizations. Uh, no more red dots. They refer people. 
Uh, sometimes I get some from Pivot to Peace. And just people I know in general. Hey, look, so-and-so's coming home. Can you reach out? Um, give me a one-on-one. -on -one. Let me talk to you. Biggest thing is the lived experience. You are able to be in front of somebody that has just done what you've done, too. I'm the example. Right. I can show you. Everybody has, that's born has a toolbox. Not everybody has a lot of tools in their toolbox. Some of them are empty. My job is to put those reentry tools into your toolbox so you can be just as successful, if not more successful, than I have been mm -hmm. on my journey. Sometimes you just need a person that's been through what you've been through, and that's what we provide. So one of the first steps we do, uh, identification. Because mm -hmm. I know if you don't have a job, you can be sent back to prison. Mm. So that's one of the first things. And there's a lot of organizations in Louisville, shout out to them for assisting with those forms of ID. Because the first thing that they're going to ask you for the job is two forms of ID. Mm -hmm. So we have to have that. We have to remove, that's a barrier. Next barrier, SNAP benefits and all other benefits. You can have, you may not have a job for 30 days. It may take you longer. Mm -hmm. Everybody has to eat. Right. And if you have a home placement, you may not have income coming in but you can provide something in that household through benefits. Thirdly, after that, Medicaid. Mm. If you get sick, you gotta be able to take care of yourself. After that, we like to schedule a mental health session. And that's one thing about FICPFM. Uh, they, last year, they provided 10 free sessions for the leaders, people in leadership positions across the nation. Uh, therapy works. I was always one of the ones to say, uh, I'm, I'm fine, I'm okay. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, with something I shared with you this morning, I'm not okay, right. uh, you know? So that's where that comes in at. And there's a lot of trauma, traumatic experience from being incarcerated. You right. come in, you come in at two o'clock in the morning, you tell me to sit on the floor in my boxes with no shirt, with hands behind my back, while you run dogs all through the unit and the mm -hmm. lockers. That's traumatizing. Yeah. You put me in a hole, for well, three and four days, mm. that's traumatizing, you know? So there's a lot of stuff that we did. Death, that's one mm -hmm. of the worst things that you can be faced with uh, when you're incarcerated. Somebody passed mm -hmm. and Kentucky DOC is determined they are not taking you to the service. Wow. Like they have no respect. It may have changed by now. I hope it has, but they have no respect for that at all. Uh, the parole board, you look at the, at the actual board, all law enforcement. Former police officers, for, former probation and parole officers, uh, judges, prosecutors, you name it. There may be one social worker. Mm -hmm. And I think that can also change a lot of the work that I've been speaking out in regards to uh, policing. Mm -hmm. We have to stop militarizing police, right? Mm. Why can't we just socialize police? Yeah. What would it look like if our leadership or if our officers had backgrounds of social work instead mm -hmm. of soldiers. I think that can make a big difference, mm. right? And I think I, th I think a lot of issues would change within this city and across the nation as well. Look at other people's model. Who's a social worker opposed to being a soldier? Mm. Because being in the military is traumatic too. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, can't, you can't tell me that you go through 10 years overseas in Iraq and you come back and you're ready to be a police officer. And that's what we're seeing a lot of. So I think that that can change a lot of the issues too. I do so much work uh, in, in different areas uh, of policing. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the DOJ report that just came out, we've spoken out, made statements on that. Accountability, uh, voting rights bills right. at the Capitol. And like I said, lobbying. Even with the ABC, we have a mission coming up with the abolish slavery. That's the story. Our constitution states this in the 13th Amendment, like this has to change. So that means that people sitting in front of you right now, Savvy Shabazz, is still a slave by the Constitution. Mm. That's what that means. You know, I was lucky enough to receive a pardon. Uh, big shout out to everyone that assisted with that. Right. Um, I received a pardon from Governor Andy Bashir in 2020. So we created an initiative to where it's like Sankofa. Mm -hmm. It's an African proverb, which means reach back. How dare I receive a pardon from Governor Andy Bashir and I don't reach back and go get others. Right. We've assisted four people, including myself, with pardon since then. We're 4-0. Right. So we have the roadmap for that. Uh, so we're looking to assist people with that. We know exactly step by step what to do 
to assist you with that. And it's more than just sending some information. Let me let me pause you on that though, because I remember your process and was yeah. you know was a part of you know helping to get through the other letters and all that sort of stuff. But you know, so so people don't understand, or so people can understand that you know the request for your pardon was in large part because you have convictions that can't be expunged. Bingo. Right. And for folks who, who don't know what I'm talking about, um, there is a process in Kentucky and in most states that after a period of time, after somebody has, has quote unquote, served their sentence, um, that you are allowed to expunge and or, or, or remove um, certain things from your record. However, the list of things that can come off your record are limited. Let me go back just a, just a step further. Why is that important? Because to all of the points that, that Savvy has been making, um, you can't access certain things, jobs, benefits, certain resources, when you have convictions on your record. It doesn't matter if you've served your time, quote unquote. Um, those things being on your record can become an impediment to you being able to do very basic things such as secure a home or go on your child's field trip or get in certain jobs, all sorts of things, right? And so you have to get an expungement in order to, to make yourself available to other normal opportunities that somebody may have. Now, again, back to the expungement part, the list is limited. And so there are only certain things that you can get off. And no, it's not that, oh, we have to keep on quote unquote violent offenses. There's a whole lot of nonviolent offenses that are not expungeable. And so here at the Urban League, we run an expungement program where we are expunging more records in one year, or in one year than the rest of the entire state of Kentucky does combined. Um, we have that many people who are facing these types of barriers, but again, they are limited by what the law states. And so in cases like Brother Savvy, where there are things that can't even be expunged, the only other alternative for getting those things removed would be a full pardon. And so that is what led you into the process to in the first place was the fact that you weren't even eligible of getting this expungement thing, which in and of itself is somewhat of a trick bag. But you weren't even eligible to get into that trick bag so that you could kind of turn your life around and get to moving things back on back on track. Right. That is that that is a fact. Um I'm, I'm, I'm smiling because you, you was a part of that, yeah. right? That really was a big part of that. And I remember, you know, hearing about the expungement. I remember going to the clinics and, and I wasn't eligible. I remember looking at that list. Um, there was a statewide organization. I remember looking at that list and my offenses were, were not on that list. Mm -hmm. I had five drug trafficking charges, class B felonies, where they would enhance a class C felony into a class B felony and possibly they were trying to get me to a class A. Mm. And I remember at that point, my sister was like, if I'm going to be defending you and helping you out, you need to come clean mm -hmm. because this is a class, they're talking about a class A offense. And this, this, this is some serious stuff here. And I'm like, it's the enhancement. And she didn't understand that. She just knew I committed some other type of offense that was class A. Mm. But because I had that class C, they enhanced it to a class B. I had two class B drug trafficking offenses. They can never be expunged in the state of Kentucky. Mm. And the, uh, there's a large number of our people in Kentucky that look like me. We don't get possession charges. We get trafficking charges. Mm -hmm. They talk about doing this and that uh, uh, once you complete your sentence. Not everyone is completing sentences. Mm. I have friends that have, I have five relatives me included. We have 171 years total for nonviolent drug offenses mm -hmm. in the state of Kentucky. And talk for for the again for the uninitiated, right? Trafficking versus possession, right? Like this is, in some regards, this is kind of crack cocaine versus crack cocaine <laughs> type of argument. You mind helping people understand what is the difference in terms of the reality, in terms of what those two things are, but then how they get treated differently. A possession charge. Um, and don't quote me on this. I'm going strictly by experience. A possession charge, meaning that I have possession 
of this narcotic, a substance. Trafficking means that I am dealing, I am distributing, I am selling uh, this, this substance. That's the difference. So one can carry one to five, the other one will carry five to 10 mm -hmm. with possible enhancements from all the other. With me, I had trafficking, possession, and possession of paraphernalia. Like the bag you put it in, like you charge me for that. Like, <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it's ridiculous. Um, so it is, it's very comparable to that, to that powder versus crack offense. And we know who took the brute force of that, of that, those laws as well. Uh, we talk about the war on drugs. Uh, we live through that. You know, we're at the age where we live through that. And my question is, who won that war? When did it end? And our people are still suffering to this day from felony offenses they caught in 1989. Mm -hmm. I have an uncle that was arrested for trafficking in a controlled substance in 1991. He still struggles to this day, and it's 2023. Mm -hmm. You know, so it, it's a big difference. And, and, and to see myself not being able to get an expungement, you know, with all the work that I'm doing, you know, I'm not eligible because of the offense. That's what pushed me into getting a pardon, and we strategized, and it was a hard strategy. A lot of it people was. think that it's just, uh, you know, pushing some paperwork in front of the governor. No, we launched a, a full on campaign, a full campaign, especially the digital campaign. Mm -hmm. Savvy Shabazz just registered. Forty people in your state can this brother vote? And I'm reading these tweets, and I'm like, oh wow, I'm seeing the media asking questions. I'm seeing the interviews. I'm seeing uh, people in legislation writing letters. I sent a, a, a email blast out to 55 people. The partner asked for three letters in return. I turned in 15. Right. You know, so it was it was a process and it's a lot of work. Uh, but I want to see more people go after that pardon, especially if you're taking the time to improve yourself and improve your community. Right. That should be a give me. Uh, everybody's, they're talking about every even with the voting rights, they're talking about once a person completes their sentence, if you get out of prison and you're on probation or parole for the next 30, 40, 50 years, we're not completing our sentences. Exactly. So how are we going to vote if we talk about completing our sentences? Mm -hmm. It's not working. You know, mm -hmm. it's just not working. So it's a system that really needs to it, overhaul. Mm -hmm. But I'm really big on this, too, with my organizations. We are led by formerly incarcerated people. Mm -hmm. We believe that we should be the people. We believe that the people closest to the problem are usually the closest, closest to, the to the solutions. But always the farthest from the resources. Absolutely. And that's something we stand on is creating opportunities for formerly incarcerated people. We have a voting rights campaign coming up. Uh, we'll be looking for, 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 some, for some people to come and put in some work. Mm. One of the requirements is that you're formally incarcerated because we want to grant you that opportunity. We want to be that organization that says yes because you have a background. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember when I started here, there, there was a particular person here, and she she was like, yes. Didn't know me from man or moon, mm -hmm. but she pushed that button and gave me a shot. Right. And sometimes that's all people need is just a shot. Yeah. Not getting that. Yeah, everybody just needs an equitable, equitable access to an opportunity to thrive, right? Yeah. Like that's all. Ultimately, that's all any of us is asking for, right? Yeah. Like this isn't about, you know, giving something to somebody who who doesn't deserve or hadn't earned or whatever. But you deserve, everyone deserves an equitable opportunity to thrive, and that's what this is about. And so, I. I I mean, I, it, it's it's frustrating to think that guys and men and women, excuse me, um, you know, at 17, 18, 20 years old, get caught up in something, right? Right or wrong, but get caught up in something. Go in, serve their time, and come out 25, 24 years old. I mean, an entire life ahead of them. And we just going to, for no reason, just throw obstacles and hurdles in their way. Like, how is that productive um, for what is supposed to be a civilized society? Like, what exactly uh, is it that we expect people to do? And that is, for me, that, that just becomes a, a strategic 
and, and logical conversation, right? Like for all the folks on the other side who tend to complain about, you know, folks not being able to, to, to pull themselves up or get themselves, you know, on the right track or do this or do that. I don't know what you want folks to do when you've set up a system that almost forbids them from being able to do that, right? Like it, it is, there's a dissonance there that just does not make any kind of sense. Um, and we've got to start to tackle that, right? Like, and so I don't know how we get it done, um, but I am, I'm just glad to be in the fight with you, brother, to yeah. be able to do this. I'm, I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad to be, to have people uh, that I can count on. Um, it's something special about being able to pick up the phone and shoot a text. You know, a lot of people in your position, uh, they probably wish they could call you directly. Mm. They probably wish they could text you directly. And a lot of people do that. I say that about my, my one friend, he, he's in the NFL, and people say, like, I can't get a hold to him. You live next door to him in the projects either. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, so I really appreciate that communication part. But it's a lot of work that we have to do. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a lot of lot of changes we have to do. We got to support each other's work. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm I go, but going back to that, man. I'm really, really big on granting those opportunities to formerly incarcerated people right. and letting letting experts be the experts in their space. Right. I'm really big on that. Um, somebody has to open up that door. Somebody has to make that change for us to continue uh, to, to look at that system. If me and you opened up a store today. The first thing that we would need to make sure that store operates is customers. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the jail. Same thing with a prison. If me and Glendon open up a prison today, the first thing we'd need is some customers. Right. We need some people to come and lay in these beds. And if I am a correctional officer, I am invested. If I'm a probation and parole officer, I am invested in this system. This is my retirement. Mm -hmm. So if my caseload has 200 people on it and people aren't getting any trouble anymore because Savvy and his organization and Lyndon and his organization is helping these individuals out and become great leaders in their community, their caseload is going to shrink. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to have a job. So that's one of those type of jobs. You really should be working yourself out of a job. Right. That's not one of those type of jobs. Though. Mm -hmm. They're depending on people to come into the system so they can continue to work and retire and send their children to college. I made a post on Facebook last week. This is it's interesting you have me here. This is re this is uh, second chance month. Mm. This is our month. This is re this is reentry month. Some people call it second chance month. This is it. So it's very special that you have me in here talking about the subject. But I made a post um, and I was locked up for five and a half years. This is just say estimated. It cost $85 per day to house me. That's like $177,000. Mm -hmm. What if I would have been sentenced to go to college mm -hmm. and get a degree, Mr. Shabazz? That is your punishment. If you do not get a degree by such and such, we may have to incarcerate you. Mm -hmm. You put $177,000 into in-housing me to make sure I'm incarcerated. And there was not one single program. And I have a portfolio this thick at home. It's not one single program that I took while I was incarcerated to help me get to where I'm at today. What it took was a support system mm -hmm. for people like uh, organizations like the Urban League, organizations like in Network for Community Change, organizations like uh, Pivot to Peace, mm -hmm. and so on, right? It took support from, those in, in, from individuals and in those organizations, but also took education too. Mm -hmm. I started learning about a pride about my people that I never knew existed. Right. So now when I walk in meetings, my chest is out. You know, I, I, I'm the man. When it comes to being an expert on re-entry, I'm re-entry. I have a shirt at home that hangs up on my wall in my man cave that says, I am re-entry. Mm. I'm the expert when it, comes to that, when it comes to that. We have to give people opportunities. And that's what we're about. It's great. Formerly incarcerated, currently incarcerated people, the opportunities. We need an administrator right now. Mm. You don't have to be formally incarcerated. And it's okay because what I found out with employment is, I've had jobs where I've had no clue, but they train me. That's right. So I can train my administrator to do exactly what we need them to do. Mm -hmm. You know, so we want to give, grant people those opportunities, but we got to keep people out of the system too. Mm -hmm. And that's why I always speak big about turning that system down. But 170 something thousand dollars to house somebody in prison. It's ridiculous. It's crazy. We're talking about five and a half years. Yeah. What about a person just done 10 or right. 20? 
or more. Mm -hmm. Now, we're talking about millions of dollars to house people. Per person. Per person. Yeah. So, man, as we prepare to wrap up, one of the things I do ask folks when they come on, and so I know Paducah is home, but but Louisville's Pete been home. <laughs> Louisville's been home. Louisville's uh, for, home. I for, love Louisville. For a while for you. And so when you think about um, this city, your city, um, what is your hope for what Louisville can be and become? First of all, I love Louisville. There's only one place that, that, that I love more, and that's my hometown. Louisville's been very, very good to me. Uh, Louisville's been so good to me. June seventh is Savvy Shabazz Day here in Louisville, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. um, I want to see an equitable city. Mm. I want to see a thriving city. I want to see barriers removed. Uh, I want to see opportunities given to individuals that deserve and earn the opportunity. When I ride through neighborhoods, I want to be able to see communities like I see on what they call true East End, mm -hmm. you know? And that's, that's, that's the issue. Uh, I was in, I was in a, a leadership Louisville cohort and, and that some of the individuals <laughs> called it the true East End. And I was like, well, when you say East End to me, I think of Shepherd Square, right. uh, up in you know, Clarksdale area, mm -hmm. you know? They said true East End. Well, I want to see the West End mm -hmm. and all of Louisville look like that true East End. Mm -hmm. Then that's when then that's when we're going to be equitable. When when we when we raise up the living wage, you know, there's not much that you can do with the economy here making eight dollars an hour. I mean, come on, right, right. We got to make sure that people have the same opportunities that we all have. Mm -hmm. That's what I want to see. I want barriers to be removed. I don't think people should be our, our housing situation. It's crazy. That's not acceptable. Absolutely. No, people are human, too. we got to humanize people. That's another thing I'm big on, too, uh, removing the language. That's one of the first steps mm -hmm. uh, that people use with us. Uh, you hear convicts. You hear felons. You hear offenders. We're, we're, we're humanizing language. Uh, uh, currently incarcerated, formerly incarcerated people, mm -hmm. directly impacted people, people with lived experience. You see how just humanized Absolutely. people? We're humans, too. So that's one of the first steps. But for this city, that's what I would like to see, equity. Mm. You know, I want I want to see I want to see people thriving in this city. Uh, opportunity. Uh, I just want to see, I just want education. Uh, we're, we're talking about black studies in school. I've been learning everything. My whole K through twelve was white studies. Right. So what's wrong with implementing <laughs> us in that? We're part of this world too, right? Mm -hmm. You know. So that's what I want to see. I want to see a lot of a lot of things change and just see the people in this city thrive and have greater opportunities than they've ever had before. All right. Well, brother, as always, man, it is a pleasure and an honor Thank to you. chop it up with you, man. Thank you for visiting the pod. That is Savage Baz. Y'all check him out. He's all over the place on social <laughs> media. And um, we didn't even talk about it, but uh, the Welcome Home podcast, y'all check him out what it comes out every week. Welcome home, welcome home. <laughs> comes out every week, right? Every week, every Thursday, we we have a podcast, Welcome Home, where we're focused on uh, formerly incarcerated people and currently incarcerated people. Too often, our stories are overlooked and they're not shared. Uh, but we want to talk about what that experience looks like in while you're incarcerated. Because you look at the media, you hear that from wardens, corrections officers, the greatest place ever, it's the cleanest place ever. That's not true. But we want to hear those experiences and lift up those voices. But we also want to hear those success stories that you never hear on media about people coming home from prison. There are people that are very successful. And we want to uplift those in Kentucky. But we also have a national network, too. So every Thursday at about 1 p.m., you'll have a new upload. Uh, we have Shelter McElroy right now. If you haven't checked it out, please check it out on Absolutely. Spotify. You can type in Welcome Home and it'll pop right up. That's what's up. Thank you again, brother. Love you. You're love welcome. everything that you are doing, man. Thank you for your contributions to this city, to this community. Um, and we're going to continue to do this work. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us here on Listen Up, the Louisville Urban Leagues radio show and podcast. Again, you can find us every week um, with a new episode live on 101.9 WLLV um, FM on Thursdays from 12 to 1230 or anytime. 
where you get your favorite podcast check us out subscribe um listen rate us review us let us know what you think of the show we appreciate you all's time and we will catch you next week stay safe The Louisville Urban League Derby Gala is happening May 3rd, featuring musical guests Joe, Drew Hill, and Stokely. Listen Up listeners can win a pair of tickets to the show. All you have to do is tune in weekly to the Listen Up radio show, listen for the contest keyword, then email giveaway at lul.org with your name, phone number, and keyword. Contest runs from March 2nd through April 15th, 2023. One entry per person per episode with seven chances to win. The contest is open to adults 18 and up. This week's keyword is Shirley Chisholm. The Louisville Open League wants to make sure that every student thrives academically. And to make that possible, the league is offering free intensive tutoring to JCPS students who qualify. Kindergarten through 12th grade students can receive export help in reading, math, and ACT prep. Kids like me deserve every opportunity to succeed in to reach our greatest potential. Sign your student up today. To learn more, visit lul.org or call 502-585-4622.